Well, good morning and happy Palm Sunday. I saw somebody coming to church. This is a great idea. I texted my husband. He's coming to the next service and told him, get out a Hawaiian shirt with palm fronds on it and wear it to church. I thought, what a great idea. You know, as we come into this Palm Sunday, as we look back at the very first triumphal entry that is shared about in all four of the gospel, we see that there were great expectations, great expectations put upon this king that was entering into Jerusalem. Expectations, how we assume things should turn out. Take, for example, the couple. They're at the mall doing shopping. Every year they've got this huge Palm Sunday family celebration at their home. So they're at the mall and they're doing shopping to get ready for it. And the wife looks around and she doesn't see her husband. And she calls him, she's like, where are you? We have got, I've got this long list of things we have to do and yeah, where are you? And he goes, well dear, do you remember when we first fell in love? And we went into that jewelry store and you absolutely fell in love with that expensive diamond necklace. And I told you, I couldn't afford it now, but one day, one day we would come back to this store and, and I will buy that for you. Do you remember this store? And she is overwhelmed because she's been expecting this for a while. She is choked up and she goes, yes, dear, yes, I remember. And he goes, well, I'm next door in the golf sh shop. Uh, <laughs> looking at a new set of golf clubs. Shattered expectations. <laughs> expectations, there, there was strong belief that something will or something should happen. Expectations, a strong belief that someone will or should act in a certain way. And when expectations aren't met, when they don't conclude as we believe they should, it leads to disappointment, to shattered dreams, disillusionment, and sometimes with anger towards God and blaming God. Disappointment comes when our expectations don't happen when and how we assume they will. Somebody has said, I had no expectations, and then you somehow lowered them. Or the guy who said the key to happiness is low expectations. Wait, wait, lower. Wait, lower. Okay, there you have it. Disappointment, disillusionment, despair rise when our expectations of situations or people are thwarted because they go unmet. So this morning, as we look at the first triumphal entry, this Palm Sunday when Jesus rides in on a donkey... You know, Jesus had walked everywhere. He didn't Uber. This is the first time we see him actually you know, doing something other than walking. But it is prophesied. So Jesus is riding in on a donkey. And they have uh, cloaks down because this is, this is a king. You know, you don't just put your, your jackets down for anybody. They are lining the road with cloaks. They, they're waving the palm branches, which, which is really a sign of a victorious king. It, it harkens back to Judas Maccabee and when he was victorious. That's what they're expecting. And they would know about this obscure prophecy in Zechariah, which is just two books to the left of the New Testament. And I'm just going to read verse 9. And if you are able, I'm going to ask, and if you'd like, if you would stand at this time for the reading of God's holy word. So as I read this, remember that this is told 500 years before Jesus ever made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Hear the reading of God's word as it comes to us from Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me, please? Lord, in the midst of a world where we have so many expectations, help us bow now and submit fully to your holy and righteous word that we would make room for the King of kings and Lord of lords to enter in. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. You may be seated. 
The crowd on that first triumphal entry had great expectations of this Jesus. They believed that he was the fulfillment of this prophecy in Zechariah, but they kind of took it out of contact context a little bit. Sure, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. Yes, he's a king. But kings that were going to war would be on a horse, a great horse, and he's on a <laughs> little donkey. And, and kings would do that, but it would be more a king that was riding to peace. But their expectation is that Jesus was going to come and wipe out the, the Roman oppression. And they are just hailing him with these palm fronds. Yes, Jesus is a king, and they expected that, but he comes not to wear a crown of gold, but a crown made of thorns. They cried out, Hosanna, save us, but expected that this salvation would come at the expense of the Roman Empire, not that Jesus would save them from sin, Satan, and death. They expected this Jesus to bring the peace that Zechariah prophesied, but they have in mind peace and rest from the human oppression. Not that this king was there to bring peace with God through a sacrificial atonement. This is a king that came not to sit on a throne, but to die on a cross. How often our expectations are shattered when Jesus doesn't do what we want when we want it. We expect answered prayers the way we think they should be answered, in the timing we think they should be answered. Take, for instance, Peter. You know, Peter loved Jesus. Jesus Peter loved Jesus with a passion. He, th this was the long-awaited Messiah. I, I mean, Peter just absolutely loved him. He had awaited him. And when Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew 16, who do you say I am? Peter nailed it. He said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the King. Now, Peter nailed it. As it turned out, this Jesus wasn't quite the expectation that Peter had. Peter had longed for this Messiah his whole life, expecting him to come and take on and overthrow the Roman Empire. Imagine his broken, shattered expectation when Jesus was about to be arrested and the servant and the servant's about to arrest him and, and Peter pulls a sword and he strikes the ear of the servant. He's willing to fight for Jesus. Imagine his disappointment when Jesus tells him, no, that is not the way of the suffering servant. Someone said that it's as, almost as though Peter is watching a Star Wars movie and expecting Jesus to be Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and lightsaber chop Darth Vader in two. Peter expected Jesus to shed the blood of the Roman Empire, not shed his own. His disappointment at his expectations of Jesus not being met led Peter to deny this Christ. Not once, not twice, but three times. I, I used to think Peter did it just simply out of fear of the crowds. And, and I don't know all the reasons God alone knew Peter's heart, but I think partially in that denying of the Christ was the shattered expectation that Jesus was nothing like he expected. Expectations based on faulty assumptions will always lead to disappointment, disillusionment, and discouragement. Shattered expectations, this place between what we expect of God and what we are experiencing. The place when we think God should act. And he's silent. And he's silent. 
And we say, we know you are Jehovah Rapha. We know you are a healer. Why aren't you healing? I know you are a deliverer. I have cried out for deliverance and nothing. Deliverance from depression. Deliverance from some besetting, strangling stronghold of a sin. But nothing. I know he is my redeemer, so why does he not redeem this situation? The marriage that never happened, or it happened and has been broken. The job that didn't pan out. The barrenness that has never been healed. The diagnosis that has shattered all plans. The child who has drifted. Lord, I worked hard, I followed the rules, and yet, disappointment. And maybe today, maybe today as you are sitting here, you are in a place of discouragement because you have cried out. You have cried out, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save me, save my family, save this situation. How do we worship this king in the moments of pain and sorrow and disillusionment? Well, I'd like to encourage us to think and pray about this, that we come to a place before the throne of God where we release and realign our expectations according to God's holy word that we re release and realign our expectations. When we have a faulty view of who this God is, we will have faulty expectations and disappointment and disillusionment. So um, somebody has says, God created us in his image and we keep trying to return the favor. This past week, our um, <coughs> son and daughter-in-law just had a, a new baby. And so I went down to San Diego this week to, to help with the two and a half year old and the um, almost four week old baby. And uh, so one morning I'm with the two and a half year old and we're in my son's office and he's got this big whiteboard and uh, they've given her some markers so that she can you know, draw on the whiteboard. And she hands me this purple marker and she says, Grammy, draw Jesus. And I'm like, gosh darn, I, did I miss that class at Fuller Seminary on how to draw Jesus 101. Well, so I'm thinking about it. And by the way, I, I kind of struggle with the whole idea of drawing a Jesus. But anyway, uh, I, I drew a cross. And she goes, no, Grammy, draw Jesus. Okay, let me try again. And then I think, well, well, God is love, so I drew a heart. No, Grammy, draw Jesus. And I'm thinking, okay, well, her parents watched The Chosen, so I try and draw kind of this thick figure with kind of curly hair and, you know. No, Grammy, draw Jesus. Who is this Jesus? I know that this week I disappointed her little two and a half year old expectation of her Grammy being able to draw Jesus on the whiteboard. Who is this Jesus? I have somebody that I've spent a lot of time, they, they've actually given me permission to share this, I won't mention their name, but we've talked a lot about faith, and they've shared with me that you know, they've come away from the church, gone away from the church, and really been consistently in the word, not because anything's happened, it's just over time. And, um, and one day, we were talking, and they said to me, Andrea, I know I'm not as devout as you are, but I want you to know I believe in God. And I prayed to him, and I'm like, you know, I'm not the you know, moral line on which people you know, believe or don't believe in God, but I said, here's my fear about that. I, I believe you believe in God. I have no doubt that you believe in God, but here is my concern. Away from the word of God, how do you know who this God is that you worship? How do you know who he is? It's just a shot in the dark that we're getting it right. In our day and age, I have my truth, and you have your truth, and look to the, they have their, and you know what, you're free to do that. 
A little truth here, a little truth there, here a truth, there a truth, everywhere a truth, truth. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but through me. And he gives us 66 books of the Bible, a love letter, giving us everything we need to know about faith and practice. Yes, it doesn't mention the dinosaurs, but it has everything we need to fall in love with the one true living triune God as he is, not as we would create him in our image. How do we realign our expectations and our will to God? We see the example of Jesus in the garden. If you go a little to the right of, of the accounts of the triumphal entry, we see Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And you know, unlike us, Jesus being fully human and fully God, he knew fully what was expected of him. He knew that when he entered into Jerusalem, he was riding to a suffering death. And as Jesus prayed in the garden and as his disciples you know, nodded off and were sleeping and snoring, Jesus is alone. And he's so struggling that he, he literally is almost sweating blood. He cries out to God the Father, if it's possible, may the cup of suffering pass. And, and, and Jesus isn't just talking about the arrest and the beatings and the betrayals and the crucifixion and the death, but this cup of suffering, the utter dark black abyss of being totally separated from God the Father and taking on the depravity of the sins of the world that we might know peace with God, amen? He knew, and in his total knowledge of all the dark abyss, he would suffer. He cried out, if it be possible, may this cup of suffering pass. But then he says this, not my will, that yours be done. See, that's the prayer that realigns us in the midst of all the way I think everybody should act and be and work according to my schedule. To let go and let God. You know, in Psalm 46 where it says, be still and know that I am God. Another way to translate that is let go. Just let go and let God. Let go of all the expectations of how you thought your life was going to turn out, how you thought your kids were going to turn out, how yada, yada, yada. Let go and let God, not my will be done. That every prayer we bring before God, however good and wonderful, not my will, but your will be done. We release our expectations. You know, in Zechariah, when it says, your king comes, it can actually be translated, your king comes for you. Your king comes for your benefit. See, we're able to release all of our expectations and all the things we doubt and don't know about because we can trust that God has our best. God has our best best benefit in his mind and heart. When it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him. You are God, I am not. And he will direct your paths. We realign when we let go and let God be God. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than all we can ask or even imagine according to his power that is work, at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. That is this God that we release it to. Not somebody who doesn't care, but somebody who is willing to go to the cross and endure it all. 
that we might be at peace with God the Father. Amen? Amen. 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 That's a biggie. I wanna close with this illustration. Um, My husband and I, very early in our marriage, after we graduated from seminary, we, we made plans. We had great plans. And what we learned early in our marriage was kind of the folly of our own plans and expectations and the absolutely overwhelming goodness of God. So we had planned that we would work. We were uh, serving at Silver Lake uh, Presbyterian Church in uh, Silver Lake, California. We had planned to work and we would save money and we would travel. And then when it worked out, you know, we would, ha- would plan to have a family. Okay, but, but we had that all lined up. Well, about a year after we were married, we were leading a Wednesday night Bible study at the church, and man, I was violently sick. And I'm just downing Pepto-Bismol, you know, like I'm breathing air. And this nurse that was at the Bible study said, yeah, Andrea, is, is there any way you could be pregnant? And I'm like, no, no, because, because we're gonna work and we're gonna save money, and we're gonna travel, and then, when it fits in, then, you know, yeah, that's, that's when we expect to have, have kids, yeah. Well, the next Sunday, when my husband stood up to announce that we were indeed expecting, he used this passage, and this has kind of become a foundational passage in our life. Proverbs 16, nine. In his heart, a man makes his plans, but the Lord determines his steps. And what I learned, and keep learning, I mean, when we were blessed with Amelia Elizabeth, in God's perfect timing, I am so grateful that God has always exceeded my expectations. In my heart, I make my plans, but it is the Lord who determines my steps. And so I can let go and release because if God before me, who or what can be against me? Amen? Amen. I don't know where you are right now and what hard place you are because it seems like God is silent. You are a loved child of God. And in God's perfect and righteous timing, because he's a righteous and a just God, He will work out his good favor in your life. Better, exceedingly, abundantly more than you could ever even ask or imagine according to his spirit, which is at work within us. Somebody with a greater mind than my own wrote these words. There is no perfect life, no perfect job, no perfect childhood, no perfect marriage, and no perfect set of people who will always do what we expect them to do. What we do have is a perfect God who is able to lead us through this imperfect life with unfailing strength, incomparable wisdom, and infinite love. Release those expectations into the hands of a God who willingly went to the cross that we might know eternal peace with him. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me, please? Oh God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you that you love each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that um, you know what tears have been wept. You know what cries have gone towards heaven. You know the pain You know the struggle. We thank you, God, that you are holy and righteous, that our king comes for us to benefit us. Hosanna, save me, Lord, oh God. You save us from our sin, from Satan, from death. God, help us to trust you. I pray that you would be very close to whoever it is that is feeling that painful place right now. Whoever it is that feels alone and unheard, God, may they know that you do hear, that you hold them, that you will never leave, that you will never forsake them. And then in your perfect timing, you will answer according to your holy will. Not our will, oh God, but yours be done. Amen. 
and amen.